so um, we're going to be going over today um, some things related to the uh, assignment that uh, many of you have finished and a couple of you are uh, still working on that because of the issues with uh, any logic in the lab. I'm told by our tech staff that they're actively working to resolve these issues. Uh, the issue is that um, in 320 uh, down the hall here, we had uh, any logic working, as many of you know, in, uh, in uh, August and uh, at the end of August. And for whatever reason, it has gotten a mind of its own and reverted to a stage where it demands a key. And as you know, demanding a key requires a day or two until the key is validated at the least, and sometimes more than that. So the tech staff aren't sure why this is. We tried a variety of workarounds yesterday. Um, that, that weren't successful. So um, I worked on it today and uh, hope, hope that by the end of the class uh, there'll be some good news. But um, in the meantime, we're going to be um, talking about uh, the basis for the model which uh, we started working with last time, um, the, the occurrence of state charts, number one. So this is the model that, that we were working with. and. Um, and uh, number two, uh, the use of messages to communicate between stations. Now, um, what I'm going to do here is to uh, just get our folks externally up to see, see my slides. Okay, and we're going to go over to our lecture notes. Here we go. Okay, so um, two big topics today. Um, describing evolution of agents in a discrete fashion. By discrete here I mean um, moving between a set of, of clearly delineated uh, integer counted number of states that are, um, that, uh, are each distinctive. Later we're going to be talking about continuous dynamics where agents uh, state can evolve in a continuous fashion, can evolve uh, in a gradual fashion over time. By contrast here we're getting, um, uh, getting these agents jumping between different state categories. And the primary mechanism we use for doing that is, is uh, something called a state chart. And state charts as in much of any logics uh, uh, elements for describing processes and dynamics of agents, they're illustrated graphically and we'll see how that works. And we saw it beginning last time. The second major topic we'll talk about is inter-agent communication, which links in with these state charts through messages. Again, something you would have seen at a preliminary level within the last class and within the problem set. Okay, so um, Let's, let's start uh, talking about these things. Um, I, I distributed, along with the example models that I, I hope everyone has uh, obtained by this point, a um, minimalist uh, network uh, ABM model. Um, we also built up a model in class last time where agents were uh, connected together with, uh, with uh, lines. And um, we introduced some heterogeneity into it. And you could use that model as well. But um, for those of you who'd like to kind of fall back to a, a clear reference model that was uh, provided to you, you can load this one in from the examples. So either use the one from last time on the one hand or, or the one from the examples called Minimalist Network ABM Model. The examples are provided on the, uh, the wiki. Uh, which you will find also now contains uh, copies of the lecture slides. So if I were to go uh, go here, um, and we were to look down in um, in this area, I think it's under resources. Um, excuse me, it's not under resources. It's under under models. I think example models. You'll you'll find it there along with some of the system dynamics models we use. So it's under. Uh, example models.zip or it's actually posted right here. Okay, so you want to open that up within any logic uh, for the following slides. Okay, so um, what we're going to be doing 
with this model is um, uh, building on what we did last time. And we're going to add a variable in, which we're going to use to encode uh, some state related to a presentation of an agent. And we're going to um, use that variable <coughs> to change the, uh, the color of an agent. And in fact, this is the same mechanism that's used in that example model that, that you tried with your problem sets. So what I'd like you to do here is to add in a variable from over here on the palette in this general model area, there, there should be something called variable, plain variable. And you like uh, you you should drag that in to the person class. So you're going to open up person uh, on the side, and then you're going to um, uh, you're going to add in that variable, and it should be called color with lowercase, and you'll give it a type a variety of this sort of variable um, that's color with a capital C. So last time we talked about a variety of types that, that are supported by any logic and, and uh, more broadly by Java. So booleans, integers, doubles, strings, and this capital C uh, color is in fact a class. It's a class provided by as part of the standard Java libraries that denotes uh, different colors. And we're going to make its initial value black here. Okay. So uh, just so I can uh, follow along, I'm going to do the same, uh, same thing here. So, um, and uh, we're going to add in this, this variable color to this minimalist network ABM model. So I call, call up person. We had added some variables in for heterogeneity last time, but I'm just going to drag on this. I'm going to do color, and I'm going to make it a variable of type color and make its initial values black. You'll notice that there's, in this version of any logic, that the capacity to associate unit information with variables. This is something I requested of XJTech some time back, and they finally added it. And this can be used for unit checking, for, for checking consistency of units. This is people per unit per day. This other thing may be um, uh, you know, heart attacks per year or something along those lines. So here we have this variable, type color, initial value black. OK, um, so that's uh, step one here. Um, and uh, you, may, you might want to follow along, uh, if you can, just some of the slides from online so you could see uh, what I just did. And th then I'd like you to make the, the color of this oval depend on the variable. Now, who can remember from last time how we would do that or could guess from last time how we could do it? How did we affect the behavior, the appearance of, the characteristics of, the properties of this oval last time? I don't remember. Well, okay, yeah, so you have to click on it. That's, that's a good start. So, okay, yeah. And, and where would you look for that sort of information? I mean, one thing I found with teaching any logic um, over the years is that one of the biggest challenges is where do you go for different types of information? There's a lot there, there's a lot of flexibility. But often students get lost because they're not sure where you would put the behavior associated with a certain type of, of process or a certain type of consideration. So here we're going to, this is a characteristic of the oval, so we're going to go to the oval. But where, where would we look beyond the oval itself? Um, what, what would he do? Okay, so here we click on the oval, we see the properties. Where do we go here? Dynamic. It's it's dynamic. Yeah, and here we can actually set the fill color. And last time we did it in a different way. We said, okay, um, uh, you know, if if they are female, make them blue. Otherwise, make them pink. Um, and uh, here, instead of putting this expression, which is going to compute the color right away, we're going to put in. We're going to make the fill color whatever the value of this variable is. And then we're going to set the variable. That's just another way of, of achieving 
somewhat similar logic. But now the value of this of this variable is going to be based on their state. Okay. So we're going to we're going to set um, based on their the state that they get into. We're going to set the value of the color variable. Okay. So um, here we've uh, set that based on on color. And if we run the model, what we should see is in fact a situation where everyone right now is of what color? They're all black because we haven't changed color for anyone yet. We're going to do so. Uh, is it color with a capital C? Oh, it has to be capital C. Because it's, it's the name of a class. Okay. In Java, classes are by default put in capital letters. No, the variable name should be lowercase by Java convention. And that's, in fact, why we do that, is to be able to, to distinguish visually between what's different sorts of things. So when we look at, at some code from Java, whether it's within any logic or externally, it's very, very helpful to visually look at it and be able to have a sense of what different things are based purely on their names, particularly the first letter of the name is, a, is often a good way. So that helps us kind of make sense of the madness we see in front of us. Um, means less cognitive overload. Okay. So anyway, we've, we've just uh, assigned color, and we're going to have some discrete dynamics that evolve that color. So let's talk about this. So frequently, not always, but frequently we wish to represent agent behavior using transitions among a set of mutually exclusive and collectively exhausted states. Um, and here... I, I should correct this slide slightly, and this should really say in one or more state charts, okay? Uh, and in general, we may have several state charts that describe behavior for a given agent with respect to different considerations. One state chart might have to do with aging, for example, what age category they're in, 0 to 4, 5 to 9, 10 to 14, etc. Another state chart might have to do with their progression vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, some health state, maybe it's uh, diabetes. Another, there are categories with respect to cancer. Another, there are categories with respect to uh, heart disease. And so we might have several state charts, one for each of several conditions. Yet another might be their status with regards to education. Uh, so are they, are they in primary school, secondary school, um, university, are they a uh, master's student, or are they stuck in the PhD vortex stage? Um, so it's, it doesn't have to be a vortex. It just looks like a vortex sometimes when you're in it. But each of those could be described, those different areas. Education might be one state chart. Um, uh, the uh, characteristics with regards to diabetes might be another. And they'd be distinctive. For a given state chart, for one of those state charts considered at a time, the agent's in exactly one state at a time. Now, we're going to see a generalization of this where we can have hierarchical states. That you're going to have, you know, some states will contain substates. But they're in exactly one simple state, lowest level state at a time. And I, I should probably, just to make that more precise, um, uh, lowest uh, level or simple state at a time, to use any logics. Um, terminology. And there'll be fixed transitions between states. By fixed, I mean they don't evolve at runtime, other than parameter values uh, that, that might govern them evolve at runtime. But the set of possible states to which you can go has to be delineated when you build up the state chart. Um, and these transitions between states occur, ladies and gentlemen, instantaneously based on the occurrence of some condition. Can anyone here give me a sort of condition that might trigger you to transition across the state chart based on your, um, based on your problem set, the assignment you did, or based on the example model, um, or anything else we would have seen last time in class? What are some situations that might trigger evolution, might trigger transitioning from one state to the other? Okay, susceptible to infected might be triggered by a what? 
mechanistically in the model, what is that triggered by? It's triggered by a message. Triggered by a message, receipt of a message. And that message um, characterizes receipt of pathogen. I mean, it models, it, it mimics, it is designed to kind of represent or characterize how we receive pathogen through someone coughing nearby us or sneezing nearby us. But it's, it's the way it's realized in the model is through a message. What's another thing that might trigger someone's transition? <coughs> a timeout. So they would leave one state to another state after a precise amount of time. Uh, yet another thing? Well, they might have a certain chance of leaving for you. We've already delineated a bunch of these, these conditions. The point is that when the transition occurs, they're not sitting in that transitionary state for some period of time. It's viewed as occurring instantaneously. They're either in one side of the, the state from which it comes or the state to which it goes at any one time. They're not, they're not kind of in the transition. In a way, it's quite like a flow. OK, um, so what I'd like to do is, with our little example model, for those following along, I'd like to build up a state chart. Mm -hmm. so let's build up a state chart and call it infection state chart. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to drag that in. So where do we go? Well, within this version of any logic, we're going to go down to state chart. We're going to drag in a state chart entry point. And I'd like you to call it infection state chart. Now, I'm violating. I stand in violation of. I, I am flouting the rules of any logic. I'm oh, sorry, the rules of Java. If, if I call this a capital I, as I did in the slides. So I'm going to call it a, a, a lowercase i and, and bring myself back in line with the rules of, any, of, of Java. Okay? Um, uh, so um, then I'm going to drag in a state, and, and we'll call it susceptible. Okay? So what have I done? I've just dragged that in, and I've connected it. Now I want you to be very careful about something. You'll notice that when you drag it in, it's important that this that it connects to the thing to which you you want to be connected. It should be green when it really connects. And um, and what you're going to do, you're going to want to sort of move it until you're sure that it connects. Notice now that it's connected, it's dragging with it. But I can have a near miss. See how it's green here? You see that? But if if it's not connected, I may have a near miss where it's something like this and it somehow looks like it's connected, particularly with these little handles on them. And I can't see, in fact, it's not connected. And if I drag, whoa, if I drag this guy around, it will, it will not move around. So you're going to want to make sure it's connected, OK? That's, it. That's an important thing. OK, um, so there's a question from the, from, yeah. Um, oh, OK, uh, I have shared the screen previously, but I will, um, I've shared in fact my entire desktop, but let me, let me uh, retry it. I'm trying now for the, um, for the uh, any logic in particular. So, so Neil, give me a second here. Um, I have, I'm just trying it now. Boom. Okay. I've just requested it again. So let me know, uh, let me know if you see it. Okay, good. So I've just added in this state here by dragging in the entry point in the state itself. Okay, so there's our, our first state. And in fact, we've, we've defined a full state chart right there. But it's a, it's a particularly trivial one, and we want to elaborate it, okay? Um, so um, what we're going to do, though, uh, because we've also dragged color in, and color is of class color with a C, Neil, you may want to check out the slides I posted on the wiki, which, um, which give these things so you could follow along, see some of my past slides. But uh, we have this, this variable color. And when we enter the state, we're going to assign to color the value green. Okay. Um, this isn't how I would prefer to do this, but this is one way. And it's, it's a way that recommends itself under certain conditions. If you have very complex conditions, governing sort of the evolution of color. You might want to do this. But for the entry action for this state, it's what this is saying is when you enter the state, do what? And this is saying assign green 
the color green to this variable color. What that's actually assigning is a reference for a color here. This is a, this is a reference to some instance, some particular object of class color. And when we assign it here to green, we're pointing it to a particular instance associated with the color green. Okay. So we're going to use that for the value uh, color. OK. Um, now, we could run our model now. And what we should see if we run it is what? What should we see? Can anyone tell me? Well, everything is green. We've exhibited a green shift. Um, and now, instead of people being black, they're all green. Why is that? Can anyone describe mechanistically what, what's gone on here? In what state are all these people located? If I were to go down and look, look they're all susceptible. And upon entry to susceptible state, their color gets sent to green. OK, but now let's add another state. Let's add in um, another state to the state chart. We're going to drag it in. And we're going to call this infective. And we're going to drag in a, a transition which probably won't be, won't be just of the right size like mine is. And we're going to call this, um, this transition infection. And, uh, and we're going to set it so that when they're at the infective, infective state here, their color is red. OK? So upon entry, to the infective state, their color becomes red. So sanity check, folks. Why is this magically occurring that when I set their color red, that it's updating their color? What is it about what we've done thus far that means that when I assign color, their color to be this color equals red for a given agent, that their color actually updates. OK, so there's a color variable, and that's what I'm assigning to here. So I'm assigning a reference to an object called red, which denotes the red color that knows how to display redness. I'm assigning that to the variable color. OK, so that's good. So color now points to red. There's big red up there. OK, now. Why is that changing the color of this person visually? What was it that I did that, that, that meant that they're, that's going to have an impact on how they're displayed? I did a very particular thing at the beginning of this lecture. Yeah, we, we had the oval. It's fill color. Remember this? It's fill color was set to be the va whatever the value of the variable is. That was a declarative specification of what its full color is. So it's just waiting for color to be, that color variable to be updated and, and, and takes, uh, takes advantage of it to display the color accordingly. OK, so ladies and gentlemen, I've just added this transition to this other state. In this other state, we set it to point to big red. Let's, uh, let's go run this model. Um, what, do we, what do we see? So, OK, yeah, so we're seeing red, right? Um, we're, that doesn't mean we're angry in this case. It just means we're, that, that we see it as red. And in fact, what color did they start? And what color did they start? Green. Started green, and then why did they all change at one time like that? Transition OK, so let's go look at that transition, the suspect transition. I didn't change any properties. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't give it any special semantics. I just used whatever was the default. I gave it a special name. Okay, But it's, you notice it's a timeout. So what this is saying is that exactly one time unit after they enter the susceptible state, they're going to become what? They're going to enter the what state? Infective state. OK, so let's change this. Let's go from timeout to a rate. You folks
books may hate rates now. You, you may, the rates may make you see red. Oh. Let's make this red. See, let us see red. Okay, so we've just changed this to rate. Let's go, let's go see red. Let's, let's run this model. Okay. Um, look at that. Do you see something different going on? What did you see different? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so there's a bit of green and there's a, a bit of red. Um, and is it all changing at once? No, it's changing at different times. Now, this rate, I would argue, is, is fully analogous to the sort of rate that we saw with first order delays. Um, with first order delays in, um, and I'm, I'm trying to see this, um, with first order delays in system dynamics models. So um, here, the rate, is an expression of, and Neil, I, I've skipped forward a couple slides um, here if you want to, if you're following along to the discussion of the, the first order delays. Um, we, we've seen these fixed rates before when we had first order delays in compartmental models and system dynamics models. So, you know, here in system dynamics, back in system dynamics models, a flow out of a stock and for a first order delay was set by the multiplication of the value of the stock by some rate of transition, some chance per unit time you'll be leaving. And, you know, I described it as a likelihood of transition per unit time. You'd have a 10% chance per day of leaving, and that meant you remained in that state an average, if there's no other outflows from that state, if you had a 10% chance of leaving per day, how long would you remain in that state on average? If you had a 0.1 chance of leaving per day, you'd remain in that state on average for 10 days, 10 days, you were 10 days. And actually, for those who had, who had, um, uh, who were interested in the mathematics, I provided a little de um, derivation of that. But it's the reciprocal of it. Remember, there's this mean time and state, and you could convert between mean time and state and chance per day or chance per unit time of leaving by just taking one over that. Remember that with with first order delays. So. You know, if you had a remained ill with flu for an average of, well, infective with flu for an average of four days or something, then your chance per day of, of recovering, if you approximate it with a, with a first order delay, the chance per day for recovering was one quarter, one over four. Um, so w remember, we could either express the outflow from a stock as one, as the stock divided by the mean time till death, or is the stock <coughs> multiplied times a rate, a hazard that was one that was one over the mean time until death. Right? You could express it any way. It's mathematically it's, it's the same thing. Okay. Um, so it, it has to be um, has to be one over. Now in this case, what we've gotten is is a very similar situation. We've got, in fact, it's mathematically identical here. We have susceptible. There's a rate out, and this rate run right now is of a value one. So that's our chance per unit time of leaving that stock, susceptible stock, and going to infected. So let me ask you this. Let me pose you this. Let me riddle you thus, ladies and gentlemen. What is the average amount of time that this person spends in the susceptible state before becoming infected? The chance per unit time is one. What's the average amount of time they'll spend there? One time unit before leaving. Some people will go before. Some people will go after. But the average time is one. <laughs> Let us make this rate 0 0.1. What's the average amount of time they'll spend in that state then? 10. Exactly. So ladies and gentlemen, let us compute. So we're going to run the simulation now. Um, I suspect a large fraction of this uh, floor is, is hearing my uh, uh, evocative uh, exhortations to this group. Um, now, whether it, it leads them to join this class in future years or drives them away, I know not. Um, but here we have 
situation where it's 10 time units. And is this taking longer or shorter for people to become, to reach the infective state? It's longer, significantly longer. There's a number of holdouts even now. Um, uh, they may be saying better dead than red or something. Um, but uh, they're holding out um, against the, the red tide. Um, so, so here we have a situation where we have a rate of 0.1. The average time in that state is 10. Some people leave before, some people leave after, but their chance per unit time, it's like each unit of time, this isn't quite true, but it's almost like each unit of time they're flipping the dice and seeing if they're leaving. But that's not true. They're actually flipping many, 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 many dice even within a given time unit to see. But it's actually computed in a much more clever way than that. They don't have to use these dice. You don't have to hear the noise of clank, clacking dice from your model. Um, it, it figures it out by drawing from an exponential distribution. The point is here, this is a chance per unit time, the rate here. I'm emphasizing this because I get questions about this. Even from within this class, I've gotten some questions about this, which is good. People are looking forward, are thinking, thinking actively about these things. But that's what the rate means. It's a chance per unit time. It's a hazard. A likelihood per unit time that will leave. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what if I turn this rate? This is a common student mistake. Can this rate be greater than one? Okay. So let's suppose I made this rate ten. What would that mean? Yeah, you're given uh, on average you're in the one tenth of a time unit. Some some before, some after. The amount of time you spend in that state is exponentially distributed. Most people leave that state earlier than, than those later. But some people leave after quite a long amount of time. But there's nothing incompatible with it. It's not a likelihood, ladies and gentlemen. It's a likelihood density. It's a chance per unit time. So, you know, this just means you're going to be very, very quick in leaving. So, um, it's not a likelihood, it's not a probability, it's a probability per unit time. So therefore it can be greater than 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 one. It's, it's, a, it's a density. Just like the rate of flow into your tub can kind of a rate per unit time greater than one. Okay, so um, that's a rate. Let's talk about um, some of the other uh, possibilities here. Um, okay, uh, well here, let's Let's do a timeout again, just, just to, um, let's make it a timeout with average time in that state of, of, of 10. Okay, we're gonna do a timeout of 10. What should we see now? Yeah, okay, okay, so it's running. And I would argue that actually it knows it doesn't have to go through it in that much detail. But now suddenly they all change at time one. Time ten. Ten, they all change. Okay. Um let's let's just put uh put a transition the opposite direction back. Now you notice I pull this out and it's uh, we can actually attach it anywhere we wish to the um to the state and it will sort of route itself properly. And let's, let's attach that new one, and let's give it a rate of, well, leave it as a timeout, uh, also of, of one for now. So we have a timeout of 10, timeout for one. What should we see now if I run this? Who, sh who can tell me? What is this going to look like? Timeout of 10 going from successful to infective, timeout of one. Okay, uh, are, it, are they in sync or are they not in sync? They're gonna be in sync, yeah. So we could speed this thing up, but we're going to see flash on. And we can speed this thing up and what we'll see is um, um, they're actually flashing in sync like fireflies upon the rivers in Asia. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, they're, they're, they're going back and forth, and we're running it at maximum speed. I will tell you, folks, that actually what it's doing there is jumping forward. When we tell it to go at max speed, 
it's being intelligent. It's not just simulating along the way in a plotting sort of way. It's actually jumping forward till the next event it has to handle. In the next event, yeah, it's going as quick as it can. And it knows that all these things are scheduled to go off at, say, time 10. So it just jumps forward to time 10, does the work there, and then jumps forward one time soon, does the work there. It, it's, it's handling this using a scheduling engine that's pretty fast. Um, OK, so we've just, um, just set that. And I, I think uh, I don't want to belabor this too much. But if we set this instead to be not a timeout, but be based on a rate, even with the same, the same mean time in there, we will see something quite different. Now we will not see them so synchronized. They will, well, tell me, will they remain synchronized? OK, I'll speed this up a bit. We're learning how to speed things up. No, they're no longer synchronized because they get out of sync through their different times, the heterogeneity and when they recover. So now we actually have a fair bit of uh, heterogeneity here, although there's still quite a lot of sort of similar time they're coming up. It's taking time to fully spread out. Anyway, these are different sorts of rates. Let's, let's talk more generally, though, about rate transitions. Um, so uh, we've talked about rates and flows a little bit. Let's, let's talk about... Um, uh, about the different sorts of rates transitions. So the first is fixed timeouts. And this is classically associated with certain processes. There are certain processes that play out in very, very fixed time. The most obvious one in the health areas is aging. You want to be able to keep track of people's age in a very precise way. Um, and um, there may be, for particular conditions, very precisely defined time constants associated with natural history. It may be if you're diabetic. Um, you're on a dialysis for a kidney failure, you're going to be going into the dialysis clinic on a very, very well-defined schedule. Um, operating rooms may get, you know, uh, open up for the first operation very, very well-defined times. Um, uh, so, so, you know, often for a given person, for example, um, the times taken to transition among different states may be Maybe quite well defined. Um, so, uh, one point here is that um, we could have the timeout, the value of the timeout here, be drawn from a distribution. So, in other words, when someone comes into this susceptible state, we could in fact have the value of the timeout uh, be drawn from a distribution. We simply for this occurrence, they will go at a, at a very specific time. And we could specify a distribution of our choice. So for example, we could have a log normal distribution um, where with uh, some log mean and some, um, uh, some uh, log, uh, log of the mode location and some, um, some other value for the, um, for the minimum or what have you. Um, so there's another possibility. That's, that's one thing. Um, uh, and another possibility is, I'm, I'm flipping through this uh, kind of quickly, is uh, a transition that's uh, rate. We've seen that. A condition transition. Now, this is going to check if uh, some condition is true within the model. And under the conditions where it is true, it will fire this transition. Now, something you have to be a little bit careful about is, um, uh, it shouldn't have to pull this transition. Speaking, using the terminology for computer science, if it had to recheck this condition almost continuously, it would be a huge burden. And so there's a way to actually tell this person class, hey, you've changed. Now go and check these conditions, okay? So generally, there's this thing called on change, the on changed event, which when you tell a person, hey, you've changed, that's when it will check these conditions. It doesn't check them truly continuously. So you have to be a bit careful with that. Um, another one which you saw is a message arrival. So here, you can transition between susceptible and effective if a message arrives. Where did we see this before? Where did we see a message arrival transition? Yeah, in the problem set. In fact, we, we talked about it just a few minutes ago. And you can set it so it goes unconditionally, or if the message equals something, or if some, a certain condition is true, 
upon arrival. And then the final one, which we'll be talking about in another few lectures, is an agent arrival. This has to do, ladies and gentlemen, with movement of agents. So if I'm, if there's an agent representing me, and I go back to my office, I will, when I arrive at my office, it'll trigger a transition that says, get out your keys. And I'll reach into my, to my uh, pocket, and I'll, I'll get out my keys. So you can set it so that when the agent arrives at a delineated destination, if you told the agent, go get water to drink at that lake, um, once, once the agent arrives at the lake, it will sort of wake up, and then it can tell to do something further. OK, so that's agent arrival. So these are the sets of transitions um, supported uh, by any logic. Um, there's a couple, there's a couple um, subtleties associated with these. And uh, one of them has to do with the, uh, the presence of self-transitions, OK? So if we were to go look at the uh, SAR agent-based example on which you folks worked, You'll notice there's a self-transition here, a transition from the agent's state to itself. And I had some comments in here um, on this, so special elements, self-transition. And basically, if we have a transition, we can draw it either inside or outside that state. And what it really means is that you are going to leave the state and come back into the same state. Useful for a couple reasons. The first thing is you might want to do something but not functionally leave the state. You might want to remain essentially in the state but, but accomplish some task. And within the model that we saw in the homework, and indeed the model we, um, that we discussed, uh, discussed a little bit to demo any logic, um, we could do something at this transition. We could send a message saying you're infected, for example, to a neighbor. Um, so that's a, a, useful, um, a useful reason to have these sort of self-transitions. Another reason to have these transitions is that this will force a recalculation. This will force it to reevaluate the conditions for any outgoing transitions. It will also force it to do any calculation like if you had an outgoing transition with a rate that depended on a value of a variable. Um, when you enter the state, it's going to evaluate that rate. And it will then keep on being scheduled at that rate. But if you have this transition sort of out and into the state, it will actually recalculate the rate associated with, um, with outgoing transitions. So it'll, it'll sort of and really what it's doing is it's drawing from a distribution as to when you'll leave via that transition if you don't leave via any other transitions. So the way this is calculating it behind the scenes is it's actually scheduling events for each of the outgoing transitions. And if nothing blocks, if you don't leave the state via some other means, it will go out, and that's the first uh, departure, it'll go out via that departure. So when you go out and in back into the state, we'll recalculate the uh, the rates associated with those, and when when you'll leave via that transition. Okay, a um, couple other uh, points here. We have some special elements associated with um, with these uh, types of models. So uh, we have some, uh, and we're going to go up here. We have. Uh, for example, a final state here, which can be used to delineate a state that a person will get in from either one state chart or, in fact, from multiple state charts, some permanent state out of which you can't escape. That state is not the state of pr pursuing a doctoral degree, nor is it a state of, of uh, being a professor, for that matter. Um, it's, uh, it's a state commonly used to denote, for example, death within these models. So there's a final state here. And when you enter that final state, you can undertake some action. But being in the state will, um, will mean that you won't be going on to any, other, um, to any other state. It's a clearly delineated state. And you can ask, is someone in that state, for example? 
multiple state charts can share the same final state in that way. Okay. Um, yet another type of construct is a branch. And you can drag a, a branch in. And this sort of uh, branch allows you to test the condition. So if you reach this point, you can go out one way or you can go out another way. If we look at the slides, I have a, um, uh, a thing called the uh, example of a conditional transition. And the point is here, you can specify some condition under which you go one way, or you go different ways out, and then there's one default way that you would transition out. One default that will be used if none of the other conditions are true. Now, for these conditional transitions, you come in and leave it in the same time step. You're not, it doesn't take any time. You don't spend any time in this transition. Instead, you come in and you are routed out via one of the mechanisms based on checking these conditions. If none is true, you go out by the default. Otherwise, you go out the first where the condition is true. And, um, and uh, that will route you to some other state. So this is a, a very useful one to, uh, to denote, for example, exposure and infection. So, so let's take a, a look at this. Um, uh, we're going to, um, let me just see, well, okay, we'll come back to that point. Um, I'm going to just eliminate this right now so it doesn't cause problems. But we'll come back to that point. And we'll see if we can make use of that. Another point that I made earlier is that you can have parallel state charts. Each state chart can deal with a certain type of uh, situations. And in fact, you can share a, uh, a final state. OK. Um, one point here about doing this, um, state, state charts look at a high level like the compartments we use in system dynamics modeling. In system dynamics modeling, when we're characterizing the state of the population, we're counting the number of individuals who lie in different categories. Here, for each individual, we're keeping track of what categories they're in. There is an important difference, a difference in terms of effective scaling, however, when it comes to this issue of, of being in multiple state charts. Um, so if we have an individual who is um, to be depicted with, with state charts here, we can kind of parse out and have be fairly orthogonal different conditions. Tuberculosis, diabetes, tobacco use, for example, here. These are each a separate state chart, as indicated by the, um, uh, by the presence of these entry states here. The nice thing about this is that we don't have to impose upon the model a consideration of all possible combinations of states. By contrast, if we had this depicted within a um, a model uh, at a high level, we would need to, so a population level model, we would need to actually consider all possible combinations. So we need to count the number of individuals who are in each possible combination of states from each of these independent state charts. Why do we need to do that? Well, we need to delineate how many individuals, say, are in this tuberculosis state chart um, who have any stage of diabetes and any stage of tobacco use. If we were to just have different stocks and flows for each of those, um, that would show you for each set of stocks and flows um, the count of individuals in each stage of diabetes or each stage of tuberculosis or each stage of tobacco use. But you wouldn't know whether a particular individual you wouldn't be able to, to reason in, a, in a, a consistent way about the number that were in different combinations. And assuming that they're all independent is often very hazardous because often there's clustering. So this provides at an agent-based level a very convenient way of summarizing um, uh, people's progression with respect to different conditions without mushing them all together while keeping them fairly modular, fairly distinctive in terms of how we, we depict them. Um, okay, uh, I'd like to talk just a little bit more about other things that you may want to, um, uh, may want to do. One, one common need is to keep track of how long someone was in a given state. Any logic, in fact, used to 
uh, used to provide a mechanism for doing that, which um, made use of a uh, call to get local time associated with a state chart. You could give it a state name and get back uh, a number for how long you'd spend in that state. Um, they seem to have deprecated that. So as best I understand from the API, now essentially when you enter a state, you have to record the time when you entered it. And you can then compute the difference between your current time and that time you entered it. It's, it's only uh, marginally worse. But there's some other things you could do with state charts. Um, so the API supports you asking a state chart, for example, what's the name of the active simple state or what's the number of the active simple state. It supports you asking, is a state active? Um, so Neil, this is on the final, uh, the final slide of the presentation, and I'm going to go back a little bit. And, uh, and the thing to note here is that each state in transition has an integer index. We name them as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. And so when we ask for the get active simple state or return a number, and that number delineates sort of which particular state we're in. So uh, here, any logic provides ways of sort of interrogating the state chart for information about which state is active. Uh, and whether a particular state is active. However, now we do have to, we do have to keep track of, of how long we've spent in a certain state. Okay, the, um, the final thing I'd like you to do before we go on to talk about messaging here is to go into any logic and go up to the help menu and go to example models. So if you call, call down example models here, um, you should be able to go to um, predator prey agent base. I'm, I'm trying to remember. Here it is. It's in the example models, the general listing of them, predator prey agent based. And if we load this in, we'll actually see a somewhat more sophisticated model. So here's we have hairs and lynxes. And let's first run this model just to, to understand the behavior. So if we, if we run it, what we'll see is some assumptions about hairs and lynxes. And we can we're going to slow this down. Right now it's set to run at maximum speed. We're going to slow it down and have these individuals moving more slowly. What we see here is, is the hares, which are close relative of rabbits, um, uh, here in green, and the red are the lynxes. And the lynxes are attempting to catch the rabbits and are pursuing them across the landscape. The lynxes are migrating in pursuit of rabbits. Okay? And what you'll see is some emergent patterns down in the lower part of the screen here concerning the populations of lynxes, shown in red, and hares, shown in green. These sort of patterns are similar to the patterns that have been seen in the wild for lynx and hare populations, starting, I believe, in the 17 or 1800s here in Canada. Um, where people notice that there are pronounced fluctuations in the number of snowshoe hares from year to year and sought to explain it. Um, now, it turns out this is a, a fairly simple model of it, that we won't, but we won't go into details on this. Let's just go look at hares. Hares are in a particularly simple type of, of depiction. Um, hares uh, have a state chart where there's a single live state called alive, and then there's a state called dead. And they, they live their life in the alive state, and then they reach the dead state via one of two routes. They either get eaten by a lynx or they die because of age. Now, in the meantime, they can have babies. Uh, there's a technical name for the babies of a hare that I don't remember, but if they were rabbits, they'd be called bunnies. Um, for 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 hares, there's, there's a term for it. I, I should remember it, but I don't. Um, but uh, the half babies is an event which goes off periodically and leads them to give birth to babies as long as, um, uh, in, in their current location, as long as it's not overpopulated and move otherwise. Okay? Um, but let's go look at lynxes. Um, lynxes are involved in a somewhat more sophisticated state chart. So lynxes uh, here, are the state chart is exhibiting nesting. Um, nesting behavior of different states. So 
there's an outermost state which denotes a lynx that is what? What do you think? If we, if we saw the similar state chart for hares, we had a dead state. What do you think this state represents for lynx? It's being alive. It's sort of a general category of, of being alive. This inner state, by contrast, has to do with with actually being full. Okay. Um, well, it's not quite full. It's 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 uh, it's actually keeping track of the last time since you ate. And in fact, you'll see that when they eat something, they go back, leave this state, and come back into it. And that's important because if they've stayed in the state too long, well, let me ask you ask this, folks. If you wanted to have lynxes starve to death if they don't eat in a certain period of time, and we had this state which captures their time since the last eating, and we wanted them to transition out, out suppose they haven't eaten in 10 days and they starve to death. What sort of thing, what sort of logic would be associated with this transition? It would be a what transition? If you want them to leave after 10 days if they haven't eaten. It's a timeout transition, you know. Um, so after their lynx hunger death threshold, they will die. Now, if they eat, what they do is they leave and come back into the state. This is one of these self transition states I mentioned. And that resets that timeout. It resets the amount of time that they've been in that state. So now they start over again. So if they're successful in eating, they can go and replenish themselves, and they get a new lease on life, and they won't transition out. So that's how that works. And, and whether or not they're successful in the hunt is, is defined by this terrible expression. This, this is, is quite atrocious software engineering, but this is... Uh, you know, put put all together in this uh, in this sort of way, but it's sort of splotched in there. And either they're successful in this based on this chance, or they have they have uh, no luck and they go back to the state of of um, needing needing to hunt. Um, and so they're hunting periodically with a lynx hunt hunt period. This is not quite so realistic, but my guess is if they had no luck, they wouldn't just retire and wait till the next hunt. They probably continue to hunt, but but uh, this is how it's depicted. So what we see here is hierarchical states, and these hierarchical states afford us some benefits, like you can have multiple substates within one substate, all of which are governed by one timeout or what have you. So you'll notice that these timeouts, these transitions, can be occur at any different level of the state hierarchy, not just of the simple state, the innermost state, but of these outer states as well can transition around, and it's very useful. You also see some of the, some of the sort of purposes of these, um, of these exit transitions. One thing I should just note is um, when you do have this sort of state here um, where, with an enclosing state, you could use this initial state pointer to point to sort of where to start inside this state sort of where do you go to start, and similarly this one here, where do you go to start, it's you start start out there. So that's hierarchical states. So any questions about state charts before I go on to discuss their interaction with messaging? Yeah? Um, say that you have um, a rate, yeah. a legal state, and yeah. then that rate's going to be updated when you enter the stage, right? Yes. <laughs> can you have a dynamic rate? You can. The way in which that you have to enforce that. So it's a very good question. And in fact, it's one of the advantages of this sort of modeling that you can have a rate that's evolving over time. Um, the, the distinction here being that, um, and, and I'm going to go back and use a slide to illustrate this, so give me just a moment. So uh, Neil, I'm going to a uh, a slide that's entitled Example Transition Rate Slash Hazard, in case you want to follow it along. So if we have a model that's a system dynamics model, a model that's a compartmental model, um, let me ask this. Uh, we focused in our discussion on 
on uh, first order delays, where we had, say, a recovery delay, and we had a formula, so this is some mean time in the infectious state, and the formula for new recovery would be what in that case, just as a rehearsal. So if we had a mean time, or say, call it recovery delay, um, an average time to recover from infectiousness, the formula for new recovery would be what? Yeah, yeah, the infectious of recovery one. Good enough. We focused in most of our discussion on that, which is a static rate. Can we have rates of transition, either in terms of mean times or phrased in terms of rates, chance for an economic transition that are that are varying over time? Can we have that in a system dynamics model? I I see heads nodding, and the answer is yes. Who can we, who here can point out to me a time varying rate here? A chance per unit time of transitioning for a given person. Show me a rate that's that's changing. Yeah, Phil. Yeah, yeah. So the force of infection is varying over time, right? Your chance of getting infected, given that you're in a susceptible state, depends on, among other things, what thing that's changing. It depends on the, yeah, the prevalence of infection. Yeah, the prevalence of infection here, which determines the number of contacts you have. So it's, it's changing over time. But what you can't have, ladies and gentlemen, in a model like this, without breaking out of the paradigm of classic ordinary differential equations going to something like delay differential equations, is a situation where your chance of leaving, say, the infectious state depends on how long as an individual you've been in that state. It's, this is a memoryless transition. Memoryless in the, state, in the sense that it, it doesn't depend on knowledge of a particular individual's trajectory. It can be changing over time. The force of infection is changing over time. But you can't have the force of, in, you can't have the chance of going from susceptible to infectious depend on how long they've been susceptible. This is considered a well-mixed stock. The number susceptible, uh, infectious is considered a well-mixed stock. All the stocks are considered well-mixed in the sense that the people within it are more or less interchangeable. So if you want to keep track of how long, let's suppose you consider obesity. It turns out that your chance of developing diabetes is higher based on your cumulative obesity exposure, so how long you've had obesity. Um, how long you've been obese, your chance per year, successive year goes up. So your chance per year of developing diabetes goes up based on how long someone has been obese. If we want to capture that in a system dynamics model, in a, in a population level model with compartments, how do we do that? How do we do that in a model like this? Or look, to use another example closer to some of your um, experience, if you wanted to say that my chance of transmitting tuberculosis to someone goes up based on how long I've had tuberculosis. The longer I have it, the worse I'm infected, and the greater my chance of developing cavitary TB, so the more infectious I'll be. If I wanted to enforce something like that, how would I do that in a compartmental model? You split up stocks. You split up stocks. You'd you take the infectious state and make it infectious one, infectious two, infectious three, infectious four. Now, straightforward, but it can get kind of awkward. And basically, you can force you to structure your model according to the vagaries of, of the data concerning how infectious TB is after you've had it for a certain amount of time, or, or um, according to the data on your likelihood of getting diabetes based on how long you've, you've been obese or whatever. Um, and it's not entirely a satisfying solution. It's, it works, but it's not entirely satisfying. Um, now, at an individual level, ladies and gentlemen, you could keep track of how long an individual has been in a certain state. So now if we're going back, let's just look at, let's just go look at our SIR model. Um, if we were to go back and look at this model, could we can keep track of how long someone has been in the infectious state. We record when they came in, and we look at the current time, and we subtract 
when they came in from this time, and we have some record of how long they've been there. And we could make their chance of transmitting depend on that without creating a separate state for it, or we can make their chance of recovery depend on that, right? Okay. But this just gets to the question of how would we how would we actually realize that? So in principle it's possible. We're keeping track of individuals here and we could we could keep track of that information. But how would we, we actually implement this? Could we have this rate depend on something which is changing over time? The answer is yes with a caveat. The caveat is it has to know it has to know to recalculate that rate. Now there's basically a couple ways to get it to recalculate the rate. One of the ways is to have a self-transition that says it's time to make the donuts. It's time to recalculate the rate. Essentially you, you go and you leave here and it recalculates all the rates. So it, it sort of this conceptually it sort of leaves and comes back in immediately and it will go recalculate all the rates and say, okay, the rate of this one is now so many per you know, so much chance per day. And we'll keep on updating it. And that's one, one way of doing it. Another way is to actually call the agent and say, hey, it's time for you to, to kind of wake up and smell the coffee, recalculate your weights, your rates. A third way is to have what's called an event, which is something we may see next time. An event go off periodically with a certain rate and says, okay, recalculate. But there is no way that it's automatically going to be trending this thing um, upon each, uh, each time um, to, to sort of be automatically updating the rate. So there needs to be some mechanism by which this rate is forced to update. And self-transition is, self-transition or, or events would be two of the most common ways of doing that. Does that make sense? Yes. So just so there's no way of how to say that. So if you're yeah. there's no way of getting past first order when integrating yeah. your rate. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um that's correct. Exactly. So to give you a sense of why this is, and and this will involve a little bit of reasoning under the hood, so to speak. What's going on when you enter this state? It is scheduling all the, the transitions it sees from the state, pre-scheduling those things, okay? So when, you're, when you are entering the state, it says, okay, if I leave by this transition, when would it be? And here, it says, oh, it's a rate, so I'm gonna draw it from an exponential distribution with a certain rate. It, it may ha you may have another transition now to the left here, you know, that's based on, um, based on some uh, timeout, and it will pre-schedule that timeout. It may, you may have a situation where a message is to be received. Now that it actually can't pre-schedule, but when the message is received, it will, it will be routed to the state chart, and then it will force that event to go. But a bunch of these things are pre-scheduled, and so it would need to sort of reschedule them, so to speak. And why does it do that pre-scheduling? Well, that's what allows it to jump from event to event to event in an aggressive fashion without constantly sort of integrating along the way at very, very small time steps. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, sorry if I, if I lost anyone with that, but fundamentally that has to go, that goes down to the fact that this is an event-driven scheduling technique. It's based on a scheduler that runs under the, under the covers. Okay, so we've just talked about uh, some of the aspects of this. What I'd like to now go do is to go to our other uh, lecture um, here, and I'm going to, in fact, stop this recording, and I'm going to stop